the most important battle in your life is the one within yourself. And you have to conquer your demons, as some put, you know, different ways of putting that, um, in order to really thrive. Today we visit Cleveland, Ohio, a culturally vibrant Rust Belt city on the shores of Lake Erie. Here, in the beautiful University Circle District, home to the Cleveland Orchestra, the Cleveland Institute of Music, and several museums, we join pianist Michelle Kahn for a discussion about her life so far, what it means to rise above our self-doubts, and how young musicians can find an authentic path. I'm Michelle Kahn, and this is Living the Classical Life. show, Michelle. Here Thank we you. are in Harkness Chapel on the campus of where we went to school. I know, and so many memories in this chapel. It's definitely a multi-use facility here. <laughs> it's like I've been in here for recitals, classes. <laughs> and it's one of my favorite pianos in all of Cleveland. Oh, that's great. Uh, and Michelle, I was uh, just telling you earlier that this summer I was overseas in Europe and I tuned into yes. a broadcast of your performance with the Grant Park Festival Orchestra, did I, did I get that right? Oh, From yeah. Chicago. <laughs> <laughs> it's in Chicago, you have that part right. <laughs> yeah, and you were performing a, a piece which has become very closely associated with, with your name and your work, uh, the Florence Price uh, Piano Concerto in, in one movement. One movement, but feels like three. But one, exactly, yeah. <laughs> exactly. So there, there you were, and, and I have to say, first of all, um, I'm, I'm heavily biased because I'm your friend. <laughs> When we were classmates at uh, Cleveland Institute of Music, it's one thing to know for ourselves the level on which we, we play, but I mean, we can't really picture where our musical opportunities will, will take us. Of course. It, does it feel totally surreal to you where you are now? Or, or was this kind of a, a logical progression in your mind? It's like, that's where I'm going. I'm going to get there. I'm going to work hard. Certainly feeling that this was inevitable, that definitely was not the feeling. I always knew that, um, you know, there's really, you know, there's no guarantee in the life. And um, the best thing that you can do is to really get to know yourself and constantly reevaluate what it is that you want out of life. Um, but understanding, of course, that you're going to have to work hard no matter what to get, to get there. Um, and so I say that to say that when I came in, as um, a freshman, oh, I was absolutely in awe and overwhelmed by the level of pianist at the school at the time. Um, I think in a certain way, I, in actually a very big way, I'm happy that I was challenged the way that I was at Cleveland Institute at the time. You know, pianists like yourself and um, many other, actually now very good friends of mine, um, pianists in my studio, Zahari Metchkoff, Olga Grelick, and, you know, others who were a little bit, you know, they were ahead of me, and I was just absolutely amazed by all of you and was able to learn from you and, and play for you, and I love that atmosphere 
at the Institute at the time, I feel that, um, you know, there's always some competitiveness, but there was a general camaraderie amongst pianists at the school. And I don't see that everywhere. I haven't come across that in every institution, but that was a really special time that I felt there was just people supported each other and I was learning from so many. The interesting point though, was that there was a crossroads for me. And it was when I was finishing up at Cleveland Institute, actually, I did um, my master's here as well. And so I was getting ready to finish that up. And I was really just plagued with self-doubt. Um, so much so that I just felt, you know, I don't learn pieces fast enough. Um, every, you know, this person, this person learns pieces so fast. Um, I, you know, I'm nowhere near as good as this pianist. Like I was just comparing myself to everybody, which at first was motivating because I was 17 and new to it. And so, yes, this is motivating and I'm learning. Then that same thing turned into um, just being completely insecure and, and doubting where I fit into the piano world. And um, I almost, I actually almost uh, left it all. I, um, which, I don't know if you knew, I was doing a biology minor here at Case Western when I was doing my undergrad. Um, and I was looking into um, maybe nursing or something, because I was always had an interest in medicine as well. But my, just my, my doubts into like, if I could be successful in this field were, you know, and it wasn't coming necessarily externally. I had support from my teachers and, and even peers to some extent, but the most important battle in your life is the one within yourself. I really think so. I think that for everyone, it's like you have to work on that and you have to conquer your, your, your demons as some put, you know, different ways of putting that um, in order to really thrive. And it doesn't matter what anyone else tells you. People can tell you that you're amazing and everyone can tell you all the great things about yourself. But until you believe them within yourself, um, they don't manifest themselves. I do think I remember you once vaguely mentioning something about a deal you made with yourself, but I didn't remember anything beyond that in oh, terms sure. of specifics. But I guess sure. that would make sense. It's like you, you're, you're really touching on what we're trying to get at with this show because it's, it's about the musical life, but it's about living the classical yes. life. Yeah, as I was saying, this deal that I made with myself was that since a lot of my doubts were, you know, pianistic, one of the things about my undergrad, which I don't regret, um, was that I was doing this biology minor. I was taking violin lessons as well with Carol Ruzicka. <laughs> I didn't know that. I'm learning I all did. this stuff about you, Michelle. I didn't know any of this. So I was taking violin lessons and for, I think it was the first two or three years of my undergrad. And then, um, it, anyway, I was involved in so many other things. In a lot of ways, it shaped who I am, and I'm glad I did it. It gave me a lot of perspective. But it also, you know, distracted from piano. So I said, okay, before you decide that this might not be worth the effort or whatever it is, um, the deal was that I would do auditions for artist diplomas um, at various schools. And another big issue, a very real issue, was that I could not afford to pay for any more school. Um, you know, even for the loans that I took out to go here, um, I knew that I could not you know, go anywhere where I'd have to pay an exorbitant amount. And there's certain schools for an artist diploma in which it would be free tuition. So, and I, and I knew at the time I didn't want to get um, a doctoral degree. And that was partly because I felt that that was still gonna put me in the same place that I felt like I was at. So I decided to you know, audition at Curtis Institute of Music, Yale School of Music, and some other schools where they offer a free tuition for an artist diploma. So I said, okay, well, if you're going to do that, you need to work harder than you feel like you've ever had in preparing these audition programs at the best, and I did. I put every minute, hour, you know, second in to make sure that the pieces were where I wanted them to be for auditions. I remember a very, distinct moment in which I had a trial lesson with Robert McDonald. You ended up studying with him. Who I did end yes. up studying with, but I had a trial lesson with him um, at Juilliard. And I remember 
that it was, um, you know, a positive experience and he was positive about my plane, but I remember that he said to me, and he's always, Bob is a very honest man, more than anybody that knows him knows that he will be very honest with you, he's also very direct. And um, I remember that he told me, and, and he did, he does this, he does this kind of deep in thought, like he's really thinking about what he's going to say, I love it. And I remember this, and he said, well, Michelle, you know, I, uh, I have to say, you know, the artist diploma at Juilliard is very difficult to get into, which it is because it is. they, it is, you are not just competing against pianists to get into that. You're competing against every instrument. And sometimes they don't even pick your instrument category, which that year they didn't, by the way. I didn't get in. I can tell you that, you know, <laughs> disclaimer, I didn't get into the Juilliard program, but also they didn't take any pianist that year. So I suppose I felt a little better about that. But <laughs> we all need these little justifications. Yeah, it was that, we not make, me. <laughs> we, yeah, we make justifications wherever we can. But that, but the, the point being is I really wanted to study with him. I had sort of narrowed him down as a top teacher, one of the top teachers that I thought would really be good for me. Um, and this was just from talking with other pianists and those that he was teaching. So he said, you know, that's going to be really hard. And then he said, well, Curtis, where he also teaches, he said, well, Michelle, I'll be honest with you. We have changed the age limit rule at Curtis at before it had been 21 was the limit, and I was 22 when I was doing the audition. And so he said, you know, we took it away, but we haven't accepted anyone over that age limit yet. So, you know, essentially saying it's going to be really hard. Um, but, you know, absolutely try. And I remember that maybe one would say that that experience would then discourage me and say, well, there's no way. Nope, that's not my personality. That was like a... Um, uh, challenge for me, challenge accepted, because I thought, well, this is part of the deal I made with myself that I was going to work as hard as I could and see this through. I'll never forget when I'm finally through these auditions. Not everybody knows this story, so it's, it's, it's fun. But I'd done everything, and Curtis was my last audition, and it tends to be the case at Curtis, we do them auditions later. later. So it was the last one, and I had, w right before that, I had done the Yale audition, and I'd done other schools as well. But, um, I was also very interested in Yale. Um, and I remember I had gotten through the first round. There's two rounds in the Curtis audition. I had played and gotten through, and I was in the final round. And the final round was a Saturday night for me. And Friday evening, I get this email. And I open it up, and it's the Yale School of Music saying I'm accepted into the Artist Diploma Program. And I couldn't believe it. I thought, oh my goodness. Wow, I can't believe this because I, that was this affirmation that said, I did it. Like, even if Curtis doesn't work out, this school will cover me. They also offered the free tuition. There was also, you know, fantastic, obviously, piano professors there. I could still, you know, um, see this through. And it also was this feeling of, I just felt the stress kind of leave me a little bit to say, I made this happen. I'm going to do my absolute best. And... And, and be myself and play the way I play and they like it or they don't. And I think that there was this, you know, resolve in my mind that had me go in there without the nervousness that I probably may have felt that extra pressure, like this has to work. I didn't have that. So I just thought I'm gonna be myself. So much so that I played the wrong piece at the beginning. <laughs> I'm actually not kidding you. I don't know why this, because different schools ask for different things is yeah. what it is. And yeah. Slight differences, and I, uh, they gave me, you know, you, you choose. They let you choose the first piece, and I played a piece that wasn't on the list. They knew the piece, but it wasn't on the list. And, and they actually let me play it through, and I'll never forget that they were shuffling papers, which confusion Gary Craftman was, and Seymour Lipkin at the time, and just, what in the? And I remember that asking if somebody had it written on their, their yeah. audition sheet, and I just sat there horrified. Like, they thought it was their fault. <laughs> and then when they asked me, I said, I'm sorry, I, um, I got confused. It's really supposed to be, it was List, Mephisto, Walt I was supposed to play. And I said, but I can play that. <laughs> and they kind of laughed. Would you say that that was kind of a eureka moment where you had, you, you, you felt like something gave you permission to just be yourself. Yes, you did the work. We're, we're talking about finding a groove. It sounds like yes. you suddenly in this moment found a groove, which was partially a function of having some validation from Yale yes, in this case. Yes, at that moment, yes. So some external validation, but then something also clicked within yourself. 
Absolutely, absolutely. It was really because I trusted myself and what I had to offer. I did, you know, achieve what I was looking to achieve. I always wonder, well, what if I did it, you know? Would I have, um, didn't get into these schools, which could have happened. Would I have taken that to mean that I wasn't good enough? Because that's not what that means either. I feel like the lesson learned is not, oh, well, be, you know, because I got into the school, this is why I was worth uh, my, you know, uh, worth it for me to pursue the dream of being a pianist. That's definitely not the lesson. But I do wonder what the journey would have been like. And I wonder, and I feel most likely, that as much as I felt at that time that way, even if I hadn't gone into that schools and I thought, okay, I'm gonna go this route with medicine, I almost guarantee I would have found my way back to piano. I just feel like, that was it. It's always been my true love. <laughs> I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna take what you said and hit the pause button because you. I heard you say, you know, this is this is me. I'm going to do what I do. Take it or leave it. Maybe, maybe this has already happened to you, where someone comes up to you, uh, a younger younger musician, facing this very common kind of moment. It's like, am I am I good enough to to go where I'm supposed to go? What do you tell that person, that young person who's saying, um, what do I do? What I would say, which I, I try to share with students, is if you are comparing yourself to external factors, if you are spending your time comparing yourself to pianists around you, then no, you're not good enough. Because you will always feel that way. There is never, ever going to be a point in in this world in which you will feel that you are as good as every other pianist around you. That, that will never happen. On some level, you will always feel that this pianist is doing more than you, that this pianist can uh, learn more notes than you, that this pianist can play four Rachmaninoff concertos in the Paganini variations of the Philadelphia Orchestra at Carnegie Hall. Yes, you <laughs> I cannot, I she's love gonna that she's going to do that all doing. in one night. Yeah, in one night. So this is my point. And if you are spending your time comparing yourself to this, you know, external things and people around you, then you will never feel or be good enough. And I say you'll never be good enough because you have to believe it. So you will never feel and believe that you are good enough. And so therefore, the only way around that is to accept Simply accept that we will always, on some level, feel threatened, and then that's something that we also can embrace, that that will always be there, that you'll never get to this point where you feel like you're the best, because if you did, boy, what a pity that would be, because there wouldn't be growth. There wouldn't be the even motivation to grow anymore. You know, that's never where you want to be. You always want to feel that there's more that you can learn from others, that there's always something that you can learn. And so this is something to embrace. Unfortunately, at that time, I couldn't embrace it. I just felt threatened by it. And I was focused on this idea. I mean, here I am, you know, at the time, 21, feeling that, you know, oh, life was over because I felt so threatened by everybody else. I try to tell, especially, you know, a young pianist, I try to tell them, if you can just trust and also tap into what is unique about you, because I guarantee you that's the beauty about, you know, live performances or any performances of, you know, repeating repertoire. People go and hear all these different pianists play Rachmaninoff concerto, so many. The reason they keep coming and keep coming, one is because the piece is obviously it's great music, but an even more important point is because they can't wait to see what you bring to it. They've come to appreciate the stamp that you put, you know, in music, and they want to hear you. They want to get to know you, the person. And so that alone is why you are okay and you will be okay because you have something to offer that nobody else does. Oh my God, Michelle, I, I feel like you need to be the host of this show. I mean, <laughs> you're, you're, you're zeroing in on every every last point that I'm trying to hit, <laughs> you know, but. Let's, let's talk about the fact that I'm, uh, what I'm hearing you saying is insight that is, is arrived at, arrived upon through experience 
and just living living life. I mean, I I know that we've had wonderful teachers here in Cleveland. You have you you had great teachers, and and you know, there might be some discussions about what can be taught in a conservatory setting, but some of this probably couldn't be taught. Did did Danny Shapiro or or Paul Shenley? You know, they're both wonderfully nurturing people. Did they have some some words for you to to help you along with this process, especially when you were going through those, those doubting phases? Yes, practice more. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> no, more You're absolutely right. They were both very nurturing and um, definitely gave me validation. Definitely did, you know, as I would work through different pieces or um, have successful recitals and things like that. I, I always felt support and validation from them. I did. Um, now, they, uh, at the same time, they could be tough and honest if, you know, I had to, there was more I need to work on. And I mean, that's what I needed. I, I'm happy for that. But, you know, again, that's, the interesting point to that. It really didn't matter what they said. That's why my advice is like, get into your own head and understand that these things are, you know, these insecurities, they exist and you're going to feel them and this is natural. But you also have to spend some time, that self-talk is so important. You have to understand that there's more beyond that. So in other words, although I had validation from my professors, it just didn't matter because I didn't really believe anyone. Do you know what I mean? In those moments, I just felt like they were just telling me what they, you know, I wanted to hear. On that point, I will say something else. You talked about, did I envision what, I, you know, the performing that I do now and, you know, did I envision all that? Well, obviously speaking on this level at that moment, I didn't. But um, even when I did, one thing that really, really changed. And I know you understand this as the host of the show, uh, as I'm sure uh, when we were in school, you didn't see yourself doing this exactly Absolutely at all. not. So Absolutely not. Exactly. So that right there is a huge point that we're also stuck in, um, and this is actually something I think that conservatories can help with. Uh, we get very stuck in, um, in a very narrow-minded uh, tunnel vision of what it means to be successful as a musician, as a pianist, or of, of anything. It's sort of hammered into us since we're children, really, as we start on our instruments. That, you know, the true success is the pianist that does this, that performs this repertoire, or performs, you know, with these groups, or performs in these halls. Like, this is success, and this is the only way to success. By the way, the way to get there is, you know, practice forever and ever, have no life, enter every competition ever and try to win them, right? And so here's the irony. Those paths actually have, th that path, those things that I um, described, are some of the ways that people have been successful. I'm not saying that, you know, winning a big competition or, you know, the practice, of course, the practice is important, but, you know, things like that don't uh, make a difference. But it's a problem when that's the only thing presented to the thousands and thousands of pianists graduating every single year because it, it couldn't be farther from the truth. And I think many, outside of even music, are understanding that being... <laughs> You know, the real winners in this world actually are the ones that kind of step out of the pre-prescribed path, yes. right? Yes, no doubt. Because it's not to say that the prescribed path is bad, but it's trying to say that, like, constantly reevaluate yourself and your interest. Because there's nothing wrong with, I'm not surprised at all when a freshman comes into Curtis or any one of these schools and you ask them, at that age, at 17 or 18, you know, what do you envision? Oh, or, you know, maybe, oh, I'd love to get into a big orchestra if, you know, they're orchestral musician or win a big competition or whatever. And I expect them to say those things and those things alone. I am not surprised when that happens. What bothers me is when I ask that same person 10, 15, 20 years later, and they still have no other interest, no other idea, because they haven't even tried to explore other parts of themselves. They believe that their only strength is, you know, when you put all your eggs in one basket, you know, you're destined for, for um, disappointment, right? Because on some level, you have defined yourself, your, 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 your feelings about yourself and how good you are, are, are literally being determined by that one little vision. And so if you don't get that, you're devastated. You're depressed, you're, you feel, as I did in those moments, you feel that you are nothing, you are worth nothing. And I'm telling you, 
the students coming into these conservatories are most, some of the most brilliant people in this country. I mean, just the fact that we're able to do what we do, we are beyond capable of doing literally anything. But we don't, we're not told, we're not necessarily always taught that. We don't even believe it. We could go any direction and we will probably be successful. So if, if, if we could understand this, I feel like it would free us so much more. It's not to say that it takes you away from pursuing a passion, but reevaluate constantly your interest, your strength, and stop feeling that that is the only way to be worth something in this world. You mentioned it here earlier, but you've spelled it out more elsewhere. One of the things you've often said to me, and I've always been very touched and flattered, is that you know, you're a little bit younger than I am. Uh, you said you always looked up to me as a pianist. I've received that and I say thank you, but it's gotten to the point now, looking at what you've achieved and where you are, I look up to you and, and oh. admire everything that you've, you've been doing, so I wanted to say thank you wow. for, for being a great example uh, of, of everything to us. Oh, thanks. That means a lot to me, coming from you. You're one of my favorite people honestly, and always have been. So it's just uh, really a pleasure. <laughs> Thanks so much for being here on the show, Michelle. It's been absolutely a thrill. Thank to you. To finally make this happen. Yes. yes. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you so much. <laughs>